William Bloodworth is the mysterious Mount Abraham medical examiner in the Final Destination franchise that seems to know a little bit too much about death. The movies provide us with more questions than answers about this character, leading fans to come up with their own theories and speculations. Is he the incarnation of death itself? Is he the devil? Or is he something else entirely? In this video, I'll be going over his entire known history to bring you the answers. So if you want to find out, stick around to the end of this video. This lesson is sponsored by Raycon. Black Friday is going to be a disaster this year more than ever, so if you don't want to literally die trying to get a deal, use my link to pick up some Raycons. They make a great holiday gift because you can use them anytime, anywhere. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, you can do this more bass and a more compact design for a comfortable noise isolating fit, they are once again my go-to earbuds. Don't literally die. Use my link in the description, get 20% off, and support the channel as you do so. But that's only for a limited time. It's going away, so head on over to buyraycon.com slash world. Welcome to Horror History. The Final Destination franchise has always done a great deal to pay tribute to the horror genre, naming many characters after classic horror icons. You can learn all about that in my Things You Missed episodes, but with William Bloodworth, they paid a different kind of tribute, by casting the Candyman himself, Tony Todd. So don't be surprised if you see his face on another episode of Horror History one day. Before I get into his history, there is an important note that I have to bring up. It seems there are actually multiple universes within Final Destination. In the Final Destination 1 universe, the Vule Flight 180 crash takes place on May 13th, 1990. But in the sequel universe, it takes place on May 13th, 2000. It's certainly possible that this was just a mistake, but I prefer to cover it up with the existence of two timelines. You think they're still up there? Somehow? Flight 180, are they still in flight? Somewhere? Are they safe? I have thought a lot about that somewhere, Alex. It exists that place. So, for the purposes of this video, I'll be analyzing the story based on the events of the sequel timeline, because it contains the most information on Bloodworth's story. To understand who Mr. Bloodworth really is, let's take it back to his earliest chronological appearance in the series. William Bloodworth's earliest known appearance was at the funeral held by Presage Paper for the 17 employees who perished during the North Bay Bridge Collapse of 2000. He tried to warn two of the survivors, Sam and Peter, what's about to happen to them. Death doesn't like to be cheated. They chalk it up to him just being a creepy guy, and he goes on his way whistling. Right from the beginning, Bloodworth knows about how death goes after those who escaped it before, and death would reclaim one of the victims not long after. Bloodworth is called to Westdale College to pick up the remains of Candace Hooper, who had suffered a horrible accident in her gymnastics routine. This accident, it wasn't just like the judges gave her a six or something, like she died. She literally died. What's up guys? Like this. At the scene of the accident, Bloodworth makes eye contact with Sam, the man whose vision saved himself and seven others during the bridge collapse. The next victim that death catches up with is Isaac Palmer, who was unable to overcome a series of accidents that occurred during his massage. Bloodworth is once again tasked with picking up the body, but this time he's recognized by Sam, who asks him why he's at the scene of each accident. William tells him that he's simply doing his job and explains that he warned them at the funeral because he's seen what happens to accident survivors before. A lucky few survive the disaster, and then one by one, death comes for them all. He also tells them that they changed things on the bridge, that they created what he calls a wrinkle in reality. This means that he's not only aware of how death operates, but also knows that something caused one of them to alter the course of history in order to escape. He does offer a solution, though. If they let death take somebody else in their place, they may be able to take that person's remaining lifespan. Then the books are balanced. William is presumably also responsible for cleaning up after Olivia, Dennis, and Nathan after each of them is unable to avoid death during a two-week span at the beginning of May of 2000. Remember, we're using the sequel timeline. He hears about how six students and a teacher got off of Vulif Flight 180 before its crash on May 13th and expects that two of the survivors will be visiting him at the morgue before long. This tells us that he's not just an expert on death, he seems to be able to predict when things are going to happen and even knows people's names before they've met before. His first job after the plane crash was to pick up an examined Todd Wagner, who was previously believed to be a suicide, until William discovered the cuticle lacerations, proving that Todd had actually been pulling on the wire that was wrapped around his neck and choked him. He was trying to escape. As predicted, he does get a pair of visitors that night, Alex Browning and Clear Rivers. He tries to get his point across to them. In death, there are no accidents, no coincidences, no mishaps, and no escapes. 
He tells them everything that happens is part of Death's design, that their friend's accident proves it now has a new design for them. They must figure out when their next appointment with Death is before it arrives. Bloodworth's seemingly all-knowing apprehension about Death, his generally creepy demeanor, his voice, and just the fact that his name is William Bloodworth like he's some kind of 2000s alt-metal front man, have led many fans to believe that he is the human incarnation of Death. But I think this scene says otherwise. For one, if Death is trying to reclaim the lives of those who escaped its grasp, why would he be warning them by giving them a heads up that Death is coming back at them? If Bloodworth was Death, he probably wouldn't want them to know that he's coming for them. He also refers to Death and the Grim Reaper in the third person. And you don't even want to fuck with that. So while I don't believe that he's the human embodiment of Death himself, I do have a theory about who he really is, which I'll get into later in his story. This time, he doesn't tell about the loophole where you can theoretically take someone else's life and be awarded their remaining years. I like to think this is because he actually has good intentions and doesn't want to see one of them turn into a killer like Peter Friedkin did a couple weeks before. So basically, he's learned his lesson. He says goodbye to Clear and Alex, telling Alex he'll be seeing him soon. Another example of Bloodworth seeming to know what's in store. We don't see him for a while after that, but we can assume he's involved in the autopsy of Terry Cheney, Valerie Luton, Billy Hitchcock, and eventually, Alex Browning. Exactly one year after Vulia Flight 180, there is another major accident, and once again, William Bloodworth finds himself tangled up with the survivors. The morning before the next accident, a girl named Kimberly Corman hears Bloodworth's voice call out her name as she wakes up, but does not yet know whose voice it is. What follows is a huge pileup on Route 23 in Mount Abraham, New York that leaves William with a lot of work to do. There are 18 casualties, and there would be many more to come due to the fact that Kimberly prevented herself and seven other potential victims from getting on the road after having a premonition. Like the survivors of previous accidents, they too start to perish, only this time the order of their accidents is reversed from the order they were destined to die in in the pileup. The first to go after the pileup is Evan Lewis, and while William takes care of the body, Clear, the lone remaining survivor from Flight 180, takes Kimberly and another Route 23 escapee back to his morgue to try to get some more information on how to survive. William is expecting them when they arrive. Hello, Clear. I've been expecting you. This time he tells them that only new life can defeat death. The introduction of life that was not meant to be. That could invalidate the list. Force death to start anew. He also calls Kimberly by her name without her ever telling him, and that's the end of the interaction. So if not death, who is William Bloodworth, and how do I explain his uncanny knowledge and ability to see the future? Well, in each Final Destination movie, the protagonists have one thing in common. They are the visionaries that have premonitions to help them avoid death's design. My theory is that long ago, William Bloodworth was one of these visionaries. He realized death was coming for him, and he avoided it. However, he was much more gifted than Alex, Kimberly, Wendy, Nick, or Sam. And he he was able to avoid death not one time, but continually. And as time went on, he got better and better at seeing the signs. As he became more in tune with his clairvoyance abilities, he started to learn how to control them, and was eventually able to look into the future more or less at will, not just when there was a major accident ahead. He ended up becoming a coroner so that he could study death, and find the patterns that death used to take out others to ensure that he does not make the same mistakes. That's why he seems to already have an understanding of what Alex went through before walking off the plane when they first meet. I think it's even possible that he has a little bit of psychic ability as well, and he may have been the one to cause Kimberly to have her vision, thus explaining why she heard his voice as she awoke the morning of. When he detects these accidents, it's in his best interest for the survivors to escape because then he'll get to see how death comes back for them and learn even more about death's tendencies. This could maybe even explain why death eventually tries to clean up the evidence after taking out Todd, by having the water that he slipped on recede, making it look like a suicide, but Bloodworth, to his credit, doesn't fall for it. So he's actually kind of a good guy, even if he really only has his own best interest in mind. Finally, this could explain his disappearance. He does make an appearance in the novel Final Destination Death of the Senses, where he feels in for a coroner in New York City, and he's visited by serial killer escapees Jack Curtis and Amy Tom, and gives them the usual vague advice. He doesn't appear again after that, but we do hear his voice in Final Destination 3, seemingly warning Wendy Christensen about the danger that awaits her on Devil's Flight. Of the end. 
after that, he doesn't show up again in the original five Final Destination films. If he really is Death's longest standing target, it was only a matter of time before the Grim Reaper caught up with him. After all, he knows better than anyone that Death does not like to be cheated. If you want to learn about the histories of other Final Destination characters, click that playlist on the left. And if you love horror, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you soon. Assuming we both survive. If you want to beat death, use a face mask and social distancing.